Hello and welcome back to the Nasty Metal Production Channel here at YouTube. This week, I'm breaking away from the album of the week to bring you the second episode of EP of the Week. And there really isn't any better release to be used for this episode than Queensryche's legendary eponymous debut EP, originally released in May of 1983 via the 206 Records label. Then, after getting signed to EMI, this would then get a wider release on August 12th. So, since we are here to give this a sorta late 40th anniversary celebration, so, let's all pour our glasses with any preferred drink of choice, bust out your copy, put it on either your turntable or disc player, and let's begin. The story for Queensryche begins in 1981, originally formed under the name of The Mob and had most of the key classic original members. Jeff Tate, who at the time was in a band called Babylon, then later Myth. At the mob's initial first run, Jeff Tate was only brought in for live performances. He never pulled the trigger on joining them because he was not interested in singing cover songs. So he stuck with myth. Queensryche eventually moved on to writing original material after getting very warm responses from audiences. So the four members began rehearsing five days a week in Scott Rockenfield's basement. The band wanted to take on the task of recording the four songs they had come up with in a studio, but they needed money to do so. So they took on at least two jobs to earn the cash to record on a 24-track recorder. Eventually, they earned enough, and by the summer of 1982, they were booked at Triad Studios in Redmond, Washington to record a four-track demo tape. They took graveyard shifts, from Monday through Friday. Jeff Tate again was asked to perform on these songs. Since these songs were original written material and not cover songs, Jeff agreed and by the end of the week, the four track demo was finished and soon would be recorded onto a cassette tape for send outs. However, Jeff was more committed to sticking with myth, so the mob was once again left with trying to find another singer. The band had made attempts at trying to attract labels to sign them with the demo tape, but were unsuccessful. The owners of Easy Street Records, located in Seattle, Kim and Diana Harris, got a hold of the tape, impressed enough to offer them a management contract. However, they needed to change the band name because the mob was not available. After failing to come to a conclusion for what this new band name would be, they then decided to name themselves after one of their songs, Queen of the Reich. They then shortened it to Queensryche, with the spelling of the word Reich being modified to Reich, with a Y to prevent being likened to Nazism. Reich, again, the, the way it's spelled where the way Queensryche went with the spelling, R-Y-C-H-E, is a Middle English cognate to Reich spelled R-E-I-C-H, which, like the German word, can mean realm, kingdom, or empire. They chose then to add in a metal umlaut over the letter Y. The band later joked that the umlaut over the Y has haunted us for years. We spent 11 years trying to explain how to pronounce it. <laughs> the umlaut, of course, is used on all of Queen's like releases, except for the 2011 album, Kim Harris would then send the demo tape along with a band photo to a friend at Kerrang! magazine, 
resulting in a glowing review and causing a growing buzz in both the United States and Europe. Following which, the Harrises released Queensryche's demo tape on record uh, through their independent 206 Records label in May of 1983. After the EP garnered international praise, receiving much airplay and selling an unusual number of copies for a small independent release, this led to Tate agreeing to leave Myth and become Queensryche's permanent lead singer. Kim Harris would convince EMI America's A&R manager, Mavis Brody, to see Queensryche perform as the opening act for Zebra from Portland and Seattle from June 29th to the 30th of 1983. Brody was obviously impressed, so he offered Queensryche a contract with EMI, and on August 12th, the band's debut EP would get a wide release on EMI America. So, featuring four brilliant tracks, clocking in at the length of 17 minutes and 31 seconds. These four tracks, of course, beginning with Queen of the Reich, Knight Rider, Blinded, and then finally ending with The Lady Wore Black. So there you go, folks. There's your four tracks. I had originally reviewed this on the channel back in 2016 as a part of my month-long themed U.S. Power Metal Month. So, here I am, six years later, revisiting this in the year of its 40th anniversary. My thoughts for the EP are as the same now as they were back then when I first published that original video on April 4th of 2016. However, what has changed is the way I now look at it. It holds a deeper meaning to me more than when I first listened to this in August of 2013. It's wild to know that the band was between the ages of 17 and 19 when they initially recorded this. Because the musicianship and writing was obviously impressive, this really was a young band with immense talent, a knack for hooks, and at times, lyrics. Jeff Tate had a voice that rivaled the likes of Bruce Dickinson, Rob Halford, and Ronnie James Dio. To the point which, when Queensryche got very big, they ended up influencing a whole new crop of metal singers who wanted to sing like Jeff Tate. E even wanting to sound like how they sounded on this. This was the template for what we now come to know as U.S. Power Metal. Queen of the Reich is one of, if not the best, openers for any classic metal release. Just those opening notes and riffs, the build-up that is like one long crescendo with Jeff Tate giving off those build-up vocals just gives me instant goosebumps. And... It's just based off of this one song that sets in sad thoughts of knowing how much they would deviate from this in the near future. Because nothing gives me the same goosebumps. The hair sticking up from my arm like, like the opening of Queen of the Reich gives. It's just absolutely brilliant. But the EP isn't just one song. It's every four songs here. Knight Rider and Blinded are practically influenced by the new wave of British heavy metal. These are just flat out balls out ass kickers with Scott Rockenfield putting his foot to work on these songs. The dueling guitars of Chris DeGarmo and Michael Wilton rival the likes of Glenn Tipton and KK Downing or Dave Murray and Adrian Smith. And on Blinded, oh my god. Is this any more effective here? Even Eddie Jackson is letting himself be heard on this song. This is another one that has a great crescendo buildup, very priest-like here, before just busting into a balls-out banger that at times marks as being the heaviest here. 
If the build-up at the beginning was effective, the ending outdoes it. From the dueling guitar solos to Eddie and Scott trading off solos to then Jeff Tate singing his ass off here with the lines, The voices are calling, the voices are calling, as it repeats, still gives me insane goosebumps. This, of course, is used as the lead-in into probably is one of the best closing songs for any EP or any release for that matter, you know, or album, you know. This is the epic, The Lady Wore Black. The lyrics for this was actually finished in the same week as the recording. I had compared this track to the likes of Beyond the Realms of Death, as that this is not so much a power ballad, but an epic, moody, guitar-driven track with... Tons of emotion. The beginning for this one is the perfect template for this. From the clean guitars that are drenched in reverb and atmosphere with those chimes being used, as well as Jeff Tate whistling, just sets the tone for this song. There's actually a story behind this, and it's one that gives you great insight into how perfect this song is. It goes like this. The whistle at the beginning of The Lady Wore Black was apparently unintentional. As Brett Miller recalls, Jeff needed to set the mood. So he had the lights turned off and sang with a single candle burning in the studio. While waiting for his first verse to come up, he whistled along with the opening guitar, not realizing they were taping him. He told them it was a mistake, but everyone agreed it was cool. So they kept it. And there you go. <laughs> I tend to agree. It has a whole other dimension to an already brilliant song. It's such a little thing, but just like me mentioning the chimes, it's the little things that actually make a song become more memorable to one, and I feel that without it, it kind of loses its mystique. So with both the chimes and Jeff's whistling, the beginning for this feels complete to me, and probably to others as well. It's what makes The Lady Wore Black infectious and sets the entire tone for what's to come, and when it builds up, it becomes all worth it. Also, the fact that Jeff Tate went all in with setting the room up to get him into the mood for this particular song just showed how much dedication he once had for this. It's not like he, he's lost it all. It's just that it's no longer the same kind of drive that he once had here. And on this track, he poured his heart out into this, giving out one of his finest performances and what eventually made him such an growing influence on every up-and-coming metal singer in the coming years in the 80s and even well into the 90s. To this day, Jeff Tate's impact is still felt. This is one of the greatest metal EPs of all time. Truly is. There isn't a dud to be found here, which is why sometimes EPs are best for this. Because if you wanted something to throw on, let's say a record, that you know that you're not going to tune out of or possibly skip a track, EPs end up being your best choices, and with this classic debut EP from Queensryche proves that. It's an all-time classic that has stood the test of time, and I'm so glad to have finally been able to spotlight it in its year of its 40th anniversary. So for any of those who have spent years cutting your virgin teeth onto this classic, if you have any thoughts, whether they are positive or negative, you can leave them all in the comment section below. But if you have never heard this, if you haven't been following me since 2016 when I first reviewed this here on this channel, then you need to correct your mistake and get this. This is a must-have for anyone who wants to hear what true U.S. metal sounds like and what Queensryche used to have sounded like. So with that... This is Heavy Thrasher saying I'm out, and I'll see you all later. 
Take care, everyone. And blast this EP loud and proud. And what Queensryche used to have sounded like. So with that, this is Heavy Thrasher saying I'm out. And I'll see you all later. And take care.